seems like nobody comes to brain research from a straight and narrow path. Uh, so what do you do after you create Microsoft Internet Explorer and set the standards for the World Wide Web in your 20s? Well, then you have time to do the stuff you missed, like go to college. But do you study computer science? No, because you can teach that. So uh, maybe you study ancient Greek. And then maybe you do 10 years of lab work and get your PhD in neuroscience and start a company that makes digital neural interfaces allowing humans to control objects at a distance through thought and intention alone. Uh, here's a man who thinks that two hands and two feet are way too little for the human brain. Thomas Reardon, everyone. So uh, I want to start with a quick question. What does the brain do? Uh, we know it has a nearly infinite capacity to perceive, to ideate, to compute. But in the end, what does it do? I'm part of a group of, I'd say, somewhat heretical neuroscientists who think the only thing the brain does is move you. It turns muscles on and off. And that's how you do in the world, is by turning muscles on and off. I'm a motor neuroscientist by training, and that'll be suffused through this whole talk. Um, Control Labs is a company that is trying to build a new kind of neural interface technology for eight billion people, not for clinical populations, not to address any kind of neuropathy or motor loss, say, but to augment us all and to give us all a new kind of experience with machines and computers. Uh, Quick background of the company, the numbers are slightly off. We were founded uh, back in 2015, end of 2015. Uh, I and two other scientists left Columbia together. Uh, we are now 70 people, 24 scientists split between mostly New York and San Francisco. Um, we're pretty well funded. Um, most recently, we've come up now to almost $70 million in venture, led uh, in our most recent round by Google Ventures, by GV, um, and a fleet of other <laughs> investors uh, who I think have a seem to have a large appetite for long-term investing, because this is not something that's going to happen fast. Uh, Paul Allen came in, the late Paul Allen, and uh, most recently Lux in New York. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the team, because we come from a variety of fields. A bunch of us come out of neuroscience, and in particular computational neuroscience, the exact same group that started DeepMind came out of the Gatsby Center, it's called. We sort of come out of the Columbia side of the Gatsby Center. So we have a very common pedigree with that group. But we also represent biomedical folks, people who've done a lot of kind of biomedical device engineering, um, some physicists, et cetera. And that's because neuroscience in and of itself is an interdisciplinary field. And when you want to commercialize it, it becomes really interdisciplinary. Uh, we started the company, most importantly, you'll see up there is Krishna Shinoy uh, at Stanford, um, really one of the gods of uh, uh, brain-machine interfaces. Uh, these are the six people who sit on our scientific board now. There's some legends of motor neuroscience in there, including John Krakauer, who's walking around here, and Greg Wayne, who you saw actually in the last talk, who's at DeepMind. Uh, I'll run right through this quickly. Um, last person I want to say who's not on this is my thesis mentor. Uh, who helped us start the company, uh, the great neuroscientist Tom Jessel, who uh, horribly passed away this week. Um, so I'll go beyond that and say, if you don't know Tom, I'm sad for you now. Um, so how did we come to neural interfaces? Uh, it's kind of straightforward. We really saw this as a simple problem between human input and human output. Human input is extraordinary your visual system, auditory system, tactile, proprioception, which we don't even think much about, your densest sense, extraordinary bit rate of information coming into your brain, dwarfs the information coming out of you by orders of magnitude. Your ability to actually get information out of your brain into the world to act is quite slow. It's bit starved. We wanted to take that problem on. We wanted to create balance between input and output. In fact, I think it's a need at this point in our co-evolution with machines, that the only way we will get joyful, empowering control over machines, digital devices, and AGI is by going direct to the nervous system and ungating 
all of the phenomenal output capacity of the brain that's actually constrained by your body, by those muscles that your brain is turning on and off. So our view of the world today starts like this. Your brain generates some activity up here in motor cortex. It designs down to the spinal cord. The final output, the USB port of the brain, are those lower motor neurons in the spinal, in the spinal cord. They generate movement, somatocentric movement, movement as you uh, ambulate. That, in turn, is sent today by machines via some kind of mechanical transduction, the transduction of a microphone, of a video camera that you're waving your arms in front of, a mouse or a keyboard, et cetera. And that, in turn, allows you to control a machine. Any of the myriad of digital devices that we interact with today, all of it goes through some form of slow mechanical transduction. We proposed that all of it could instead go direct from the nervous system with or without movement, the movement's irrelevant. But the rate of information that comes out of the brain is extraordinary, faster, more supple, lower latency, and ought to be used to directly control these kinds of machines, and therefore to allow you to imagine not just control over existing machines, but new kinds of experiences. Like what would it be like to have eight virtual arms and have the full fidelity of being a virtual octopus, or as John Krakauer says, he really wants a tail. Uh, so how do we do this? Uh, we put a device on you, and we put it right at your wrist, the most densely innervated part of the human body, probably twice as much of the nerve density and cortical real estate as what your mouth gets for chewing and speech production. This is where all your volitional and skillful control resides. It's an extraordinary end effector here. The nerves that control all this stuff actually reside in the arm. We put that there and we get this uh, array signal of all of what's called surface electromyography, the electrical response of the muscle to the innervation from uh, these spinal motor neurons. We get this really complicated signal and the first thing we do is we split that up, deconvolve it, so that we get the electrical activity, the contractile response of each of those muscles. And that allows us to first take on the problem of getting rid of all the old devices, all the ones that require you to actually move. I'll let you do that now just from the electrical activity. So I'm gonna jump into some videos, which will be most of my talk here. And we set ourselves the goal of saying, could we recreate a virtual hand just out of the nerve signal? And that's exactly what we did. I hope this will play. There we go. So, oh, this is me. Um, so, this is me, I'm moving my hand, I've got this little wrist device on here, it's going Bluetooth or computer, and you'll notice it's the full reconstruction of a hand, there's no camera here, and it's the continuous movements of the hand. Each individual finger, et cetera. These are complicated movements, I will tell you that this was a mother of an ML problem, uh, with incredible real-time fidelity. That is real-time. The neat thing is, the electrical activity precedes the movement by 100 to 160 milliseconds. We actually have a nice computational budget to get the virtual hand to move in real time. Uh, I also want to emphasize in this that it's really not the movement that matters, it's the nerve that matters. And what you'll see here is basically, I'm not moving at all, but the nerve wants my hand to move. So the virtual hand moves. And I'll go on and show you, I forget what's next, let's take a look. Oh, this is where we take that and we map that now to what it would be like to control things at a distance on a VR experience. So this is a person who's doing a little pinch thing. The pinch force sets that beam. It's the forces across the joints, not the fact that your hand is in a posture. And here I'm gonna kind of do this Luke Skywalker thing. I bring the block to me and I push it away from me. It's the amount of force that's in my hand that controls the speed of the block, not the fact that my hand is open or closed. It's how much open and how much closed. Any motor neuroscientist would kind of intuit that almost immediately. So I'll go on beyond that and say these are what we call biomimetic things that are based off of the movements that you would have generated, but we're just doing it off of the electrical activity. Here we actually trained it, you know, because of course keyboards are this 19th century technology we all get stuck with. We wanted to get rid of that. That's actually me with my tattoo here, uh, typing in the air, just tapping on a table after I trained it on a keyboard in the past. Uh, this is very old, this is two years ago. Um, not quite ready to show the latest stuff, but. Uh, so we have text working. This is uh, probably our most useful application of the technology. This is Adam Berenzweig, who uh, took this $50,000 Canova robot um, and turned it into um, the world's most expensive back scrub. 
<laughs> and the neat thing there is that robotic arm has seven degrees of freedom, much more degrees of freedom than your hand itself has, and he's able to actually combine some biomimetic action with things that are really at the level of the nerve. Um, I'm gonna go quickly through some other ones. And here, here's Greg Wayne. He was on the slide in that last talk, a scientist from DeepMind who's on our scientific board. The cool thing is Greg's put, put on the banner for the first time He's trying to control this virtual hand and he's getting control of her finger and you kind of learn the virtual hand and it learns you. It takes about a minute, but here's the crazy thing. Greg doesn't have a left hand. And this is the first time he's ever put on that band. This is, I was actually filming this and blew my mind. And it's all of the forces across the joints that he actually was born without that he's able to pretty much inside of two minutes create a full control surface over this virtual hand you can learn a sixth, seventh, eighth finger. I have what done now. That's a grasp, he'd never grabbed something in his life. He says that right here, I've never grabbed something before. And he's able to generate the nerve equivalent of a grasping command. Uh, our goal is to take eight billion user technologies and ho have those filter back to clinical populations rather than start in the clinical population and bring that forward. I'm uh, going a little long here, I apologize. Uh, last thing, I've got to get this in because this is really the root of this and why this is a neural interface. There's neuroscientists all over the room here. So I can't believe how many of you forgot the basics of motor neuroscience to, to remind everyone. There are these things called motor units. You've got a nice set of motor neurons in the column L inside the spinal cord. You see that red neuron out there. It connects to just the red fibers in the muscle. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between that motor neuron and those fibers. Just one-to-one. -one so that when that motor unit, that, that together is called a, a fiber. So when it fires, only the red ones come on. When the blue neuron fires, only the blue fibers come on. And that is at the neuromuscular junction. That's a 100% faithful synaptic relay. It's not a stochastic synapse. So every single time we see a fiber response, a spike of, a, of a, what's called an MUAP, we actually can reconstruct the spiking activity of motor neurons in the spine. Neuron for neuron, spike for spike, non-invasively, dry electrodes. It's never been done before. Uh, and here's what we can do with that. I'm gonna skip this very, very important ML point that we try to make. We think this is the first time it was ever done non-invasively in which we take the spiking output of neurons and feed it through a convolutional recurrent neural network to be able to drive real-time adaptation in your nervous system. I'm gonna blow through that. It's crazy, it works. Uh, here's Steven, he's uh, trained a single motor unit. He's not moving at all, there's no contraction in the muscle. He's controlled one spinal motor unit to jump the dinosaur here. And uh, what you'll notice is that same motor unit isn't just provoking the jumping during natural movement. It's only when he intends it to jump. He'll pick up a load here, he's got it here, and then he'll say like, you know what, even under load, I'm gonna jump the dinosaur right here. Boom. Uh, so load invariant, invariant to naturalistic movement. You still have control and can learn rapid control over individual motor neurons and use that as the anchor for all your interactions. Uh, and the last one I'm gonna leave you with, this is my favorite. Uh, this is my co-founder, Patrick Kaifosh. He's trained himself to do, if the sound is on, that would be awesome. Play asteroids. He's doing it out of one hand. In the arcade, this was two hands. And he's doing it without moving. It's two degrees of freedom, or continuous degrees of freedom, not just button pushing, and the button pushing of a fire control. And he actually gets pretty damn good at this. What you really get is like, how fast can you get to the cognitive control limit, not the motor control limit. Uh, this took him about five minutes of training to be able to figure out how to go do that. You've never seen asteroids with neurons before. All right, uh, I made this point earlier. I'll close on it here to say that this is technology we're designing to go back into the clinical population. John Cracker, who's also here, is one of the key uh, uh, scientists that we collaborate with, Jens Bo Nielsen on cerebral palsy. And uh, I'll leave all this stuff to go by. We're deep, we're neuroscientists, we're trying to bring back into the community. And uh, we've started to sample this hardware. It's crazy, it works. And thanks for letting me go way over. Thanks. Thank